So I was invited to talk about templates, which is interesting because I haven't actually done anything with templates in a really long time. So uh, as a result, I actually might have troubles filling an hour of this. So uh, interrupt me whenever you want to have a more interesting discussion. Uh, so first of all, I, when I started doing the slides, I wasn't even sure why we were discussing templates in 2014. But interestingly enough, there has been a little bit of a change because when I looked at templates properly, that was three years ago, and back then everyone was doing JavaScript uh, single page applications, and they didn't really use templates all that much. Um, three years later, that turned out to be not the best idea, uh, and part of the reason is that the cloud is actually faster than your mobile phones, where you're now rendering most of your stuff, and it's really hard to make nice JavaScript heavy user interfaces. So a lot of people actually go back to rendering things on the server, uh, definitely we are doing things on the server again, um, so we are actually still using Jinja and that's fine. Uh, but I suppose the reason why this thing actually comes up is talk about performance, that seems to be why most people ask about Jinja um, or templates in general, uh, especially in relationship to the Django template engine which is not very fast. <laughs> um, so, but anyways, so a little bit of history about Python template engines. <laughs> So the first thing that was ever there was Mod Python. I don't know if has anyone ever used Mod Python, and I don't mean like Mod Python just to run Django. Has anyone used proper Mod Python? Mod Python had this thing called PESP. I think it's like Python Server Pages, and it looked like a PHP. So you had like opening bracket thing, and then you can actually run Python code in in your templates. Um, that wasn't a very good idea. And then the next iteration after that, which became quite popular, I think, was Webware. I never used this. Uh, but Webware, through many years of Ian Bicking's work, eventually ended up being WebOp, which um, is the base of uh, Pylons and Pyramid and some other things. Um, in 2003, we got the Whiskey spec, and then in 2005, there was Django. And Django actually was the first framework for Python, I think, which had a reasonable template engine. So, um, in fact, it was such a good template engine that lots of people cloned it, uh, including Ginger One, <laughs> which was quite literally uh, just the Django template engine without Django. Um, and I don't think anyone actually used that properly. Um, the, the, the one that most people use is Ginger Two, which only came two years afterwards. And then after, I would say about ten, 2010, I haven't actually touched Ginger Two feature-wise at all anymore. Um, but there was a time when I tried to integrate the principles of it to make the Django template engine fast, which um, was a pretty big failure, to be honest. Um, but in many ways, I have a really hard time talking about Jinja as a template engine, and the biggest reason for that is that Jinja for me is code I really don't like looking at. Not because it's particularly not nice, but because it could be so much better. Um, and that's because I basically learned programming with Jinja 1, and then with Jinja 2, I just kind of uh, did a little bit better, but still, I still would like to do it again. Um, but it's, it's like Python 3, if I would actually do that, just to make it, it's not broken enough that it's necessary to replace it. Um, and because it would break people's templates. So for instance, one of these nice things it has is, um, I didn't really understand what priorities of operators actually mean in practice. So if anyone actually tries to do math heavy things in the template engine, you will notice that the um, multiplication operator has a higher priority than division, <laughs> which makes no sense at all. But, but then people do multiply and divide in templates to do, figure out how wide the template is and uh, image is. And I wanted to fix this and I actually broke someone's template. And then I decided to not do this correctly, um, just because you break people's stuff unintentionally and then you never know what happens. Um, and actually, the, the bigger problem change has every once in a while some templates don't properly compile. And that's because the identifier tracking in it is not perfect. And that's really hard to fix, actually. And I, I will go into this a little bit later. But overall, the problems are not big enough that there is a reason for me to fix it and then potentially breaks people's things. So it's not broken enough for rewrite. There will not be a changes free. Uh, well, at least there will not be a change of three unless people say, like, we want to do this. Um, okay, so but so what's actually the difference between Jinja and Django from, from the whole point? Because Jinja actually, I mean, you look at the syntax, it clearly started out as being a clone of Django's templatings. So wh wh where do they differ? And, and the biggest difference is, obviously, one of it... 
Uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, Jinja is a is a is a thing that transpiles, so it compiles Jinja code into into Python looking code. And the reason it doesn't actually generate bytecode was because it's more portable this way. And the only reason was Google App Engine, because on Google App Engine you couldn't actually do bytecode generation directly. Um, so it went into generating Python code, which wasn't the best idea because it allows less than you could do on the bytecode level. Um, but it's in, in, in many ways, that was actually a much better idea because you can actually debug this now, um, which is much trickier if you just look at bytecode because humans can't read this easily. Um, so in, in both cases, Django and Jinja do the same thing. They start out loading a template source from some form, usually file system. Um, but it doesn't have to come from a file system. Lots of people load their templates from databases or other things. Yeah, for instance, if you have, um, I don't know, if anyone used Shopify or something like that, you can upload your own templates onto their system. Um, that's sort of how this works. You load the template source from, from your database. And then you feed the source to Alexa for making <coughs> little tokens out of it, and then actually convert this into a node tree. Most people in most people that use Django have no idea what an AST is. Most people that use Django have because you need to make them to build these awesome template tags. Um, so yeah, the, these nodes are quite literally exposed as an API in Django. And then where it goes different in in Python, it compiles the bytecodes through a level of compiling to Python code. Um, or in, in Django's case, the ASD is kept around and you render it later. Um, for rendering, both Django and Jinja create a context object uh, of some sort, which holds all the data that, that should be available to the template. And then you take your node tree or your, your bytecode and you pass the context to it and then you, you get a result back. Um, but on, even though that looks API-wise, very much the same, the internals are so different that it's not even funny. Um, and the biggest reason for that is in order to end up with a result, it's not just that you on one side evaluate bytecode and the other one you evaluate an ASD, it's that everything from start to finish is just structured completely different and it has really strong implications on every single level. Um, and it starts with simple things. So for instance, in in Jinja and in Django, the parsing already starts out completely different. In Jinja, there's a grammar which um, includes everything in the template. So you, you, the, the parser starts out, or the, the lexer starts out, knows this is template source, and when I encounter a block open tag or a, a comment open tag, I switch parsing context, but I stay within the same general parsing structure, and then I, I build um, tokens and nodes out of it. Uh, which means I can arbitrarily nest lexical constructs, which is very useful. Um, because, for instance, in Django, if you open like double brackets, you cannot include double brackets anywhere in that statement, which is why we have these things like percent template tag open brace <laughs> to make two braces. Um, in in Jinja, that's not a problem because as the parser. <laughs> As the parser encounters an opening brace, it will know it now it's in the context. So if enclosed strings are contained, it doesn't actually have a problem with this. And it also balances braces, so it is actually, um, for, from a parsing point of view, it's very different. In Django, it, things work very different. The first thing is it has a two-stage grammar, if you can count it that, if you call it that. <laughs> um, because the lexer basically splits your whole template into, with a regular expression, into things that look like a variable, things that look like a block, and things that look like a comment, and everything else is template data. Which means, first of all, variables, and, and I think it even contains for blocks, cannot be multi-line. Uh, which is really funny in templates when you nest a lot of like filters together, so you end up in column 120, but if you would make a new line, it no longer works. Um, also, that includes even comments, so comments are also single line, unless you use the block comment thing. But the real problem with this is not that the parsing is so weird, it's that the second stage lexer is manually written within each block tag, and as such, wildly inconsistent. Um, while it has been cleaned up greatly, um, the way it does that is still very um, very weird. So what this means in practice is that if you have the statement, if expression, blah, 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 and if, the way it looks in Jinja is the parser creates tokens, the first one called block start. It's the name if, it's an identifier expression. It's actually weird because both of them are named, so this is actually wrong on the slides. 
and then block end, then the data is three dots, and so forth. And in Django, it's just the block if expr, data block end if. And this whole string needs a second stage parsing, which breaks us into smaller things. So um, as mentioned, this example, um, in Jinji, because it knows in which state it is, it can just include the whole thing in itself, and it's fine. In Django, you end up with some template that can comment open, <laughs> comment close. I, does anyone actually use this? One person. How, how do you, what, what do you do when you need to embed, I don't know, JavaScript that includes this? Not do that? It's, it's really weird. Um, but yeah. So there's a, like a raw type, okay. Um, yeah, so in any case, this is, a, this is a side effect of the parsing. Um, and then the purpose of the node tree that generally gets created from from the parsing stage is also different, because in Jinja you end up with, um, with a node tree that then gets compiled into bytecode, where if, and then the nodes are thrown away, um, whereas in Django the nodes generally stay around forever. And that causes quite a few confusion for people that come from uh, Django templates and try to do something in, in Ginger because Ginger does have extensions, but the nodes they generate are not available at runtime. So you can't do clever things like find me other things that surround me to figure out where I'm located, um, at, at runtime at least. Uh, whereas obviously in Django they hang around, there's a render function on it and you can generate strings. Um, also, the callbacks actually render uh, recursively into strings, which from a performance point of view is not particularly good. <laughs> um, yeah. So the, um, that's a duplication, I think. Yeah. Um, so extensions in Jinja are heavily discouraged. You shouldn't build them, and largely because the interface was only added for domain-specific extensions, like for instance, if you want to have uh, translate tags that are that you want to extract out of your code. Um, but the syntax is consistent with Jinja core, and that's because you need to follow the general grammar, at least from a token point of view. So you can't, for instance, in, in, in Django for a really long time, I don't know if it's still the case, the SSI tag, the path it included wasn't actually quoted. Um, you can't do that in Jinja because a file path is not a valid string. It just it will give you a syntax error. Um, but also the extensions need to generate nodes that change your node. So you can't make your own node and say, oh, I will do this now, because the compiler will say, I have no idea what this node is. Um, and because you compile into source code at the end of the day, um, it's really tricky to debug what actually happens. So s extensions are possible in Jinja, but they are heavily discouraged. And Jinja counters this with giving you enough flexibility in the language that it's less important to build extensions. Whereas in Django, the extensions are everywhere, like everyone has uh, template tags. And they can have custom syntax and in many ways will do. Um, and the debugging of the extensions, in general, the, the debugging of Django templates is not so bad, but it only works because you have this debugger middleware, which will give you some support for this. If you render templates in Django from the Python shell, for instance, the error reporting it will give you is is really um, actually I don't think it does it give you any error reporting. I think it will just give you a trace back somewhere in Python and then tell you something went wrong somewhere. Um, so the, so the, the the way this is structured is different, and because of how different the core design is, um, the way you interact with the template language is very different. Um, the once both of those engines actually go for rendering, they also do different things. Ginger will compile into Python code that generates strings from a generator. Um, that it does for a bunch of different reasons. It's not the most efficient way to do that. You could just append to a list and that would probably be a better idea. The reason why it does it is because the way to generate more and more responses in WSGI is uh, a generator. So if Ginger wouldn't use a generator to generate this. You would have to use greenlets to do context switching and all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, and that allows Ginger basically to be used to generate gigabytes of data if you would want to do that. So you could generate a one gigabyte um, CSV file with Ginger and it would work. Whereas if you would generate a gigabyte CSV file in a Django template engine, you would probably need multiple gigabytes of data because at any point you recurse, you generate bigger and bigger strings. Um, so the intermediate strings will be much bigger. 
Um, yeah, so the, the rendering in itself also works different. A huge difference is error handling. Um, if you use Ginger, because an expression can call other functions, and all the functions in Python can again call templates and templates again call, it's actually very common for a Ginger template to call back into Python and then call into Python into Ginger code of another template. Because, for instance, what people do is they make a little template which is not included, but it's, it's wrapped in a Python function to render a little widget, like, for instance, um, a sidebar somewhere. So what you end up, you have a, a Ginger template which calls a Python function, and as an implementation of that Python function, it calls another template. Uh, and because that is something that is tricky to debug if you wouldn't do it uh, as a core a concept in language, uh, Ginger actually just gives up on its own error reporting and will say we are just integrate with the Python traceback. Um, so when, when Ginger crashes, the Python traceback and the Ginger trace, traceback are the same. Um, in Django, the error reporting is quite simple. And also, if a variable f is missing in Django, you just get an empty string, which um, works, which is quite nice. Uh, because if you iterate over it, empty string iteration is, um, is obviously no iteration at all. But in the way it works in Ginger is it gives you a dummy object, which is called an undefined. And the undefined can customize uh, what it actually does up to the point where it will give you errors when you use something that doesn't exist. Um, this is the other huge difference between Jinja and Django, and that's what the concept of the context is. Um, so the context object in Jinja stores everything, like all variables, and not just the variables, it also stores all the other states that comes up during iteration. Um, and at any point is this the primary source of data. So if you have um, a tag, a, a, a custom template tag, and it gets a context object provided, it can guarantee that any variable contained in this context object is the last state it was in the template. What this means is that, for instance, if you have the um, cycle tag in Django, the cycle tag can cycle between even and odd strings, for instance. And it will do this in, in relation to the current iteration of its for loop. And the way it's implemented, it will say, look at the context to find the last for loop, and then on the last for loop, look at its last iteration index to cycle my local variables. Um, which means, it's in, for this to work, the context needs to store everything. Um, in Jinja, that's not the case. The context is the source of the data. And where the data actually lives is completely undefined. And in fact, with, with, with the exception of top-level variables, the context is never in sync with where Jinja actually stores the data. So, Things like the cycle tag is technically impossible to do in Jinja because there is no way to relate to, to the for loop guarantees. Um, but there, there are replacement constructs that do work. But this big difference means basically you can't have custom template tags in Jinja that work on the same flexibility as you have in Django. Uh, auto escaping is very different. The auto escaping in Django is quite Django specific and it largely only lives in the template engine. So in the template engine, you can do auto escaping. You can you can from your Python code mark things as being safe, so it doesn't have to be escaped. Um, but because Ginger works much closer with Python, it actually has some. Um, it used to have its own system for doing auto escaping, which was quite flexible. Uh, but because other template engines want to use it as well, this is now uh, exposed into a standardized library. Standardized. It's called Markup Safe, and it. It is a standard as in it defines a method called underscore underscore HTML underscore underscore. And this is actually supported by Django, which surprised me, uh, in one way. So Django safe strings, if you pass them to Chintra, they will still be accepted by Chintra as this is already escaped, uh, but it doesn't work the other way around. No. OK, uh, it, it, maybe it does work in both directions. Um, but from a simple test, it didn't seem like it worked. In any case, the way markup safe works is some um, uh, markup as a class is a string, and it. Sorry. If you wanted interruptions in the middle. Yes. Uh, sure. Escaping um, is not always into HTML. Sometimes it's into JavaScript. Okay, so the escaping is not always into HTML. It's also into something in JavaScript. Um, this is actually interesting. So the escaping is actually always only into HTML. Like even. It's, it's tricky. So obviously markup safe and how it's implemented always escapes into HTML. Um, so it doesn't do anything else. But 
when you use the a template engine to actually generate. So the only other case we have another escaping is if that is then contained within um, a block in HTML that is not HTML rules following. So for instance, if you have a, a dictionary and the dictionary you want to uh, serialize into JSON and you want to put that JSON dictionary then into a, string, in a script tag, it needs to follow other escaping rules than general HTML rules. Um, that's true on the paper. In practice though, it's actually nearly impossible to safely embed JavaScript, uh, JavaScript JSON dumps into JavaScript unless you follow an ever-evolving rule of what browsers actually accept as safe there. So it actually ends up, currently for instance, if you use um, the, the, the JSON library in Flask, the JSON it generates for HTML consumption is such a small subset of HTML that you don't actually need to escape it anymore because it doesn't include any characters that can appear in, in HTML. Um, and that's actually the only way to make it safe on certain browsers, which surprisingly enough are not Internet Explorer. Um, there, for instance, um, I think it was Chrome which had this behavior where you can actually escape out of the script tag without using backslash script. So there, there are ways to escape this and the rules are really complicated. So in practical terms, you only ever have to escape to HTML uh, or, or XML, and, and this does XML as well, obviously. Um, so yeah, there, there might be some, if you would write into LaTeX, for instance, you, you would have to implement a different form that escapes to that. Um, but in all other cases, you will always at one level have to go through HTML, so this class works for this. Okay, um, so Django templates. After, uh, as mentioned before, after the tokenizing, it looks at the first name of the block tag to figure out which sub parser it has to invoke. And then it looks for parsing callback. It splits it into smaller chunks and then eventually creates a node. Um, so, since there are many Django developers here now, I could figure out who actually wrote this first iteration. Simon. 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 Okay, so the first iteration was really good because um, someone learned what an EST interpreter is and that worked. But then at one point, and that before the initial release, that rule was thrown a little bit overboard and state was stored on the nodes. Which meant, and if you have used Bitbucket after it was initially released, Bitbucket had this thing where they, they had performance issues, so they decided to cache the templates, the template nodes between render steps. So if you were, and Bitbucket was very small at that point, if you were standing on the page which had even and odd row numbers, you hit refresh, you could see that even and odd was always changing <laughs> because it was not thread safe, it kept the last state on its node tree and, and used it like that. And it was actually, it's like many of the nodes that Django has were actually not trivial to then fix to not require state to be stored on there. So if you look at how this is implemented now, the, the context object does not just include variables you define, it also includes um, arbitrary Python objects, which refer back to um, to nodes to then store extra state on it. Actually, it gets really comp complicated and confusing at this point, um, but it is thread safe now. <laughs> um, so it generally how it represents is if you have hello variables slash escape, it's not entirely like that, but there's a node list, there's a text node hello, there's a variable node with a filter expression, which has a variable and filter escape with no arguments. Um, and then I can't show you the whole code that renders this because you end up with nearly nearly touching every line of code in the base template engine, which is about 1,500 lines. But for the base node list class, and this is the concept you see everywhere, there's a render function which takes context and then it for every node contained in itself, if it's a node, it renders it. Otherwise, I don't even know why there would be something in there that is not a node. <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, it does that. And also notice it sets it to none. So instead of continue, which means the force text function has a special case where if none is passed, it actually returns an empty string. So that's a little bit weird. Um, but that's, that's the general behavior it has. Um, as an example, so the if if node has a condition node list for each condition in node list, if the condition is not none, it tries to evaluate it against the context. If the variable doesn't exist, it just silently says no match. And then if the condition is not provided, which is the else block, it will always match. And if it matches, it renders the associated node list. Um, 
It's very straightforward. Everyone can understand this. On the other hand, Chincha is really, 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 really complex at this point. Uh, complex way past why I should actually do that still. And I don't want to touch it anymore because it works. <laughs> um, so as an example, the, so this on the bottom is what it compiles to. It doesn't actually look like that, but I, I threw away the stuff that's um, unnecessary to throw into the slides. But if you have hello variable escape, escape is implied in Jinja if you have auto escaping similar to Django, but it acts as a good example. It, it looks at the variable in the context, so it fetches it from the context. But at that point, the context stops being relevant because it's a local variable. Then it fetches the escape filter from the environment of all filters. It yields hello, and then it calls escape through the escape. Um, so this is super confusing now because auto escape is enabled. So it calls escape twice. So the, the one escape on the outside, it's the other escaping. Um, but in any case, this is what it generates to. Now, this is the part where it comes fun, because Chincha has certain assumptions about how things work, and it gets super aggressive in optimizing. So for instance, it, it has the rule that any filter you use, unless it's marked with a certain decorator, is pure, which means that it doesn't have any side effects, which means that if it can guarantee you that it doesn't have to call the filter, it will not call the filter. So if you do on a constant string escape, this whole block goes away and it just writes hello escape world. So it doesn't, it doesn't ever call the filter anymore because at compilation time it already figured out that this is completely unnecessary and we'll just call it once. Um, that, that's one of the optimization it can do because it knows that filters cannot do crazy things. Um, but it also does it for anything else. So for instance, loops. This loop is fast because it just iterates through it. It doesn't do anything else. It, it gets the sequence from the context. For each item, the sequence, it yields the, the list item thing, and then escapes the item, and that's it. It, it also does this um, set variable to missing thing. That's also completely unnecessary for the general case of just rendering. Um, but it's very useful for error um, for error debugging because if you get a trace back in there and you use a, a middleware in your web application that can show you which local variables are defined, <coughs> by setting it to missing again, you know that this variable is gone. Um, so this is just a debug helper in there. But what you notice in there is that if you do it in Django, you have a for loop dot index zero, so you can see like what's my iteration step. So that's that's clearly missing in there. But at this point, it comes in helpful that Chinger can do certain optimizations. So if you start using this, it will actually change the code completely, and it will generate this in. Also, notice that here it uses two yield statements. In the next one, it actually goes into a string formatting function, because it has an internal threshold, at which point it knows that string formatting is actually faster than generating two yield <laughs> statements. So it, it's really quite... Um, complicated. Uh, blocks convert internally into um, Python functions and they can refer to each other and that's also in Django if you if a node contains subnodes each node's render function generates a string so as you call deeper and deeper and deeper templates you generate more and more strings that are then thrown away to generate a larger string um, but Jinja does instead it has generators everywhere, and if it goes into a sub generator, it just yields all the items through instead of actually buffering into a string. There are cases where it can't do that, but in all the cases it can detect why it can do that, it will just skip all the expensive things. Supering into higher templates is super easy as well. Um, the root function is the base of the template, block title is a function that's just a block. When it loads the template, for the layout, it will go through all the blocks that it finds in the parent template, which is put on the stack. And then it will render the root functions from the parent template. And the parent template gets the same context, so the context can look at which blocks have been replaced. Um, and to, to super into a higher block, there's a, there's a function provided on the context. And one thing you can notice is that super here uh, is just a regular expression. Not, not a regular expression, it's an expression that is not irregular. <laughs> <laughs> in the template engine, but because it knows it's contained within a block, the parser flags this name super special and will, instead of converting it into look into the context to find something called super, it knows, oh, this is special, I will just generate a completely different statement out of it. So context.super title is 
sort of magic in the, in the template dimension that this works. And this is the part that I'm super proud of. It actually has this trace back integration. And this actually works by monkey patching C Python internals. Um, but <laughs> it works and it's pretty cool because you can, you can see there is, that it renders a template. So this is the example template which divides by zero. So that's stupid. But uh, it, you print template render somewhere in your code and you can see why you call this. And then there's two frames I can't hide, unfortunately, uh, because Python. But then all this stuff, all the other trace back frames are actually within a template. So you can see like where in the template it called something that eventually called into another template, something that broke. So you can see exactly where it happened. Um, and that's that's possible because the there's a lot of debugging information available in the engine which it can rely on. So the problem is like why can you not make one like the other? Like why can you not make Django like Ginger? And I tried that as a Google Sum of Code project a while ago, and I actually had a version of. So I didn't have it at the time of the um, of the Google Sum of Code project, but I had a fairly working version of the Django template engine subset that actually compiled into Python code, and it was slower than the than calling the just doing what Django does normally. And the reason is really that. The Django template engine gives you so many possibilities of doing things that you can't make them fast. Um, because Ginger, is, at the end of the day, it's fast because there is there's stuff in the language that enables you to just, just do things quickly and just ignore a whole bunch of overhead. And in the Django template engine, you don't really do that. Because people like the Django template engine because of extensibility, I think, to a large degree. Because Every, I don't know if they like it for that, but at least everybody makes template decks. And you can't do that in Jinja. It's just too far away from that. And if you try to make this flexibility of that Django has work and make it fast, you, you just can't go there. Um, but then there's also it's just a different philosophy on how the language looks at the end, because Jinja has expressions, and you can do loads of cool things with it, but apparently you can also do lots of not so nice things with it, because that's sort of the argument against it. Um, yeah, but Ginger for the most part is fast because it doesn't do things if it cannot do things. And that's the actually compiling it to Python and then running it turns out to be slower unless you decide to not do these certain operations. So um, I don't think we will ever see uh, a Django template engine that is using the same tricks as Ginger does without breaking huge backwards compatibility. And we know what happened. Well, actually, I don't know what happened with Python 3. I have a very negative opinion on Python 3, which apparently not everybody shares. <laughs> so maybe we should do uh, a, a, a new Django template engine that is uh, following some of the making it fast principles, but then breaks everybody's templates. I don't know. Um, how many here are actually using uh, not Django templates, but any other templating engine for things? It's a very little hands. So most people here use Django templates. How many people here actually use Django templates for lots of their things and not just generating JSON things out and then running the clients? So who is actually using lots of Django templates? And who is using lots of clients at JavaScript? That's surprising. So yeah, lots of people here like the Django template engine and as such, um, I don't know like how the future would look like if Django would ever propose to replace it with something else. Um, because it would break everybody's code. And how many people here would actually want change it to replace the Django template engine? Yeah, it's it's like a couple of years ago, I think a lot more people supported this concept, and now everybody has legacy code. So <laughs> <laughs> something happens. <laughs> yes. Can you ask the reverse question as well? Yes. Can you ask the reverse question of who wouldn't want it to do that? Who would not? Uh, I assume the rest. Who would not want that? <laughs> who, who would not want Shinjin to replace Django as a template engine? I, I think the question is confusing enough that... <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I think the cost-benefit um, relationship is not quite clear. Um, so, I, I think at this point, 
at least from my perspective, I, I'm just sort of done with template engines. I don't want another project to maintain. So I will not write a template engine for Django. Um, and the Django template engine hasn't actually been touched significantly in, in the last three years either, I think. So, <laughs> nine. <laughs> nine. <laughs> so it, it's just a problem that is solved to a large, good enough degree that I think no significant change will happen. Um, so, it, I, yeah, just to repeat myself, I don't think it will happen. However, um, it could be that there is a future Django version which might have pluggable template engines and you could just do something else for some of your things. I, I could see that happen. Um, but then you open a whole can of worms for what happens actually if you make pluggable apps and they provide templates for things you do. And, uh, <laughs> Hello? Okay. Uh, I actually brought down um, something about... I will apps in my... I just can I brought down the theory for pluggable apps in my uh, Django enhancement proposal, and the theory is that uh, a uh, most apps do cannot really ship templates because if it's user-facing, uh, it has to be integrated into a base template or something, so there's no generic solution that actually works for shipping templates in pluggable apps for user-facing stuff. And if it's admin facing, well, basically you can ship a, a, a standalone set of Jinja2 templates or Django templates, and it's gonna work. You just have to tell the developers that maybe they need to configure a, a Jinja2 back, Jinja backend. Uh, so it so it already doesn't work. work. So it already doesn't work, for basically. Uh, and yeah. I'm saying that I'm not making the situation any worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so there, there is actually, yeah, it's really hard to fill an hour of, of templates because it's really not that interesting in itself. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm opening up this for just random other questions related to the topic or not to fill the rest of the slot. <laughs> so just partly to fill in why I gave the microphone to Enric at that point is for the, those of you in the room who may not know, which possibly includes Armin. Um, Enric is currently working on exactly that feature, pluggable template engines. Um, so hopefully that will be landing in Django at some point in the future. So he's got a question for Armin. Right over there. So uh, when you mentioned how this madness started, uh, have you heard about a project called Chirp? and a uh, template engine called Twig. Yeah, I wrote one for PHP, which was basically Jinja, which apparently PHP people still use. So there's uh, the Symfony framework, and the Symfony framework uses a template engine now called Twig, and I actually wrote this many years ago, and it was written in PHP, and it was also a Django version, a Django-inspired template, en template engine, which is slightly different again, because it was not fun to write Jinja again. Um, but yeah, the, the two big, Frameworks now, which use um, Django inspired templates. One is uh, Flask, and some others that derive from it. And the other one is uh, Symfony. And there is a Django inspired template engine for Ruby on Rails called Liquid, which also is very popular. So Django templates are everywhere. Only <laughs> faster. Um, Curtis Maloney and I, um, Curtis, some of you may, him as, may know him as Funky Bob on IRC, are currently trying to write a template engine that first uses uh, Outline for the parsing and fixing part, and then um, yeah, compiles down to uh, directly to the Python AST. Um, yeah, if anybody's interested in this project, yeah, come to me tomorrow. Um, we can talk about it. May or may not be insane. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I hear that your interest in uh, maintaining template engine that somehow faded. Um, from your perspective, well, what do you what do you see as a Jinja two future? Is it just stable and not going to upon much, or are you going to bring more people on board to help maintain it, or how do you see it? So we'll definitely bring more people on board to maintain it because at the moment it's basically. Not even me. <laughs> so the problem is, like, at one point, you just like every time I use one of my projects to an extended 
level, I will find things that I want to change. But it hasn't happened in the last few years because I'm not doing any more interesting things with them, so they work for me and I don't want to break my own things, so I don't want to break anyone's stuff. Um, but it has definitely... So there, there are some long-standing issues in Jinja I just don't want to fix because the last three times I tried to do that, I made it worse. Um, so I don't actually know what the solution for the future of Jinja 2 is. It will most likely be um, some form of new maintenance release and just fixing some smaller issues, but will not add any new features, I think. Um, the last big change was the support for Python 3, um, and that was that made some progressions, I would say, in how it works, and I would like to fix them. Um, because it's actually a lot slower now than it used to be, just due to how it works internally now. Um, so that, that fixing that would be nice. But I don't think I will do anything else. Thank you. You had mentioned early on that um, you you'd sort of seen a trend towards, I guess, front-end rendering, you know, single-page apps, and now you're seeing a trend away from that. That really in intrigued me. I wonder if you could say a little more about like well, so your, exactly, your point of view there. It's definitely exactly for us, I think. So for us being the company I work for, um, and I work for a gaming company in London, and we have a lot of server-side infrastructure, and we have um, user facing uh, administration interfaces. And we played around a ton with Angular, and that was not at all what we wanted to do in the end, it turns out. So we render pretty much everything on the server now, with the exception of these small areas that are actually interactive. Um, but we don't have, like, I don't know. I Maybe there are areas where it makes really a lot of sense to do a lot on the client, um, but I think it's still contained within single pages, like interactivity on a certain thing. Because from a user point of view, I think it's much nicer to actually just like. So for us, why it breaks down to use Angular and things of that sort is it's really hard to give the user the experience where you copy paste the URL and then he'll go to a new tab and so that he's exactly the same thing as he had before. Um, so getting this done with all the statements, the URL and everything there is really tricky and it's. And that's a really good feature for a user. That's the one thing everybody seems to want is like predictability that if I send someone else a link, it will look exactly the same and it will look load quickly. Um, the extra time required to actually do that in an application that is based on JavaScript seems to be not worth it. Um, but it would be different if you would build something, I don't know, Facebook chat or something, like something highly interactive, then I guess it's different. Uh, how many people here actually do single page applications and? Uh, and how many do single page applications for mobile devices? <laughs> how many like doing, of those with the hands up, uh, keep the hands up of the ones that do a single page application for mobile devices, and how many of them actually uh, think it's better than doing that on the server? Like server side rendering. Ah, it seems to be everyone. So it's, it, for, I would say there, there are definitely some people that have good working single page applications. Um, <coughs> As a user, I can spot them usually when they don't work, which is really disappointing. It's, it, it happens way too often that it just opens, like, just open the AngularJS documentation is really frustrating experience, because first it loads empty, and then all of a sudden stuff comes in. And that's just not very nice. Um, but yeah, there, there are definitely lots of stuff that does run on the client. <laughs> okay, I have a question. Um, the Jinja 2 engine is here because the Django engine is slow. That's the reason? Uh, no, so the, the, the reason Jinja 2 as a template engine exists is because I haven't been using Jinja at the time, when, uh, I haven't been using Django at the time when I was writing it. Okay. Um, so I need a template engine, and the only other ones there was Jinja 1, which I made exactly to not have the Django template engine. Uh, because I don't know if you have used Django when it initially released, but it was basically very hard to use any of the functionality and not pull in the rest of Django. Um, it still is, yeah. Yeah, so that, that was the reason why, why it initially came, but not at all performance. The, the reason why performance at one point became interesting was just because um, there, there were two template engines which were really fast. One of them was Mighty and the other one was Spitfire. And I was interested in can I beat them for performance. And that was, that was the only reason why I changed that. Okay. Because then my second question was, what is wrong with caching then? <laughs> so I just cache everything if it's slow. 
It has like the whole rendered end result. For example, or parts, or it's, yeah, you can do Yeah, it's just caching. really hard to do that. I think the only reason caching is actually really hard. Um, yeah, it's it, the hardest thing to do for programs. <laughs> and they maintain right. Yes, so <laughs> it, caching the stuff is just really hard, and not having to do that is really nice. Because <coughs> caching, like in Jinja 2, you still cache things, but you cache the representation of your bytecode. And, and then you render that, and it's quite fast. So you don't have to cache. Um, it, caching dynamic content just doesn't really doesn't really work for most people. So the point where caching really fails is if you want to do a template-based form rendering, uh, it's typically something you cannot cache, uh, and that's super slow with uh, the general template language. And how slow is slow then, in, in terms of... Uh... So slow is really, really slow, because... Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was... I mean, like, for me, really slow is when it starts to approach a second for response time and Django yeah, templates for large like if people go really overboard with doing like especially form based rendering and things of that sort you, you have function calls in the 50,000s 100,000s in there and if you actually look at what it is this is not your database this is actually your template rendering code okay, thanks <laughs> If you want to make the Django template language slow, put an include inside a nested for loop. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Back here. It's not really a question, but I just wanted to mention that I really haven't wrote any lectures or parsed it anymore so ever since the inclusion of the assignment tag. So that was the, mo the biggest problem I had with, uh, with the custom template tag. So I think one of those things has been solved uh, about uh, having custom lectures and stuff like that. Also, um, I guess the, the, the thing where you have to uh, quote strings actually instead just uh, mention them as if, as if they are strings, but don't quote them has also been changed a lot. So I think the Django template language has been standardized a, bit, a little bit more over the years than it has, so maybe it, it has been become easier to, to, uh, to make it fast again, or maybe I think... The problem is not the syntax, the problem is just the runtime behavior it has. The, the syntax is also no longer broken, which is good. Yeah. Although I did find a bug yesterday. <laughs> I, I as much as broken as it used to be. <laughs> so I didn't find it yet because I was too lazy, but um, the with ratio block tag. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you divide by zero, so it has a store in variable thing, but if you divide by zero, it will always print zero. It will never store it in the, in the, in the variable you provide. So um, there's just there are two branches, and one of them just only works in one case, and that's just uh, the fact that you have all of these texts with store in variable is just uh, <laughs> yeah, it works, I guess. <laughs> well, one one quick question from one of the persons who. I love his hand for, for uh, doing a single page chat and I actually enjoy it. Uh, so uh, we do have the Django backend and we do do some template rendering every now and then. But uh, in node land, you have this promise that seems to be unfulfilled, but still that to, to do uh, templates on server and client so that you can do like kind of a hybrid approach. Uh, which seems to be the golden, uh, like the, the grail of, uh, of it, to be able to do do when you land on the page, do the, that that kind of approach. That means being able to write templates in like handlebars or similar template language. Do you have any like? Now you you're not into template language anymore. Uh, but so I I had I had one project was called Jason Chinja, and it was the attempt to write. Um, a template engine which only accepts JSON data and it renders the same on a server and a client. Um, and that didn't turn out to be an interesting project, mostly. But also it was just very frustrating to get the to find a, a good middle ground that actually works exactly the same on a server and a client. Because what most people actually do, they find a language that is close enough for server and client. That is for instance there's a JavaScript implementation for Jinja, which apparently works. And um, who told me that today? Yeah, Carl said that he, the way he solves this problem is he just has some um, tests that run his templates both in the client and in the server, and then he just manually works in the subset that works the same on both, um, which I guess is painless enough that it works, so there's no reason to write something that's actually guaranteed to be the same on both. But this guaranteeing that a template evaluates the same on the server and on the client 
that is much easier if your language only is like mustache or handlebars or something very simple. But once it goes into the, the, the area where people like, like change are using for because you have expressiveness and everything else, at that point it just becomes a, a huge pain to support them both. Especially if you go into providing all these functions extra. So I, I don't know if it's worth it. The reason I wasn't super interested in client side rendering was mostly because of uh, event handlers getting, getting lost if you replace like a fragment somewhere. Um, and then people start attaching the event handlers on the part they never replace. And then it becomes really hard to figure out like where my event hands actually live if you use the inspectors and everything. So I don't have a good solution for that. It's just I, I know people do that um, and it works. I wrote a few years about how cool that is and then I tried it myself and I didn't enjoy it. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know. Next question? Carl. This is actually a question. I just wanted to follow up on that and say the, the JS implementation of Jinja 2 is called Nunjux, and it's not 100% compatible, and it is, it is a problem with like helpers and things because you have to write them twice, and so it's, it's far from painless, but if you do need to render on the client side and want to share templates, it's the best solution that I'm aware of. Tom. Oh. Thanks, Armin. Uh, a couple of things. Simple one first. So, do I understand correctly that the the right alternative to template tags in Jinja is to pass functions into the context? Uh, yeah. For for most things, you can. So, first of all, you can just pass functions in the context and they will render. But also, you can use the call syntax where you can pass a sub part of the template as a function back to the function. So, for instance, you can do um, like if you want to include a whole bunch of template stuff which you want to like show or not show or show like render 10 times you can just do call function and then blah 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 end call and the part from call to end call goes as a lambda back into the function sounds really confusing right now but it's actually very simple so you can build things like uh, if or something of that sort okay cool uh, the the second one is a question for the audience um, so I'm interested because uh, rest framework 3.1 will have this public API for templated HTML generation, who would prefer to be writing those templates in the Django templating language? Show of hands. Who would prefer to be writing those templates in the Jinja templating language? Okay, uh, and who would prefer for it to support both? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Don't ask that question. <laughs> there are a number there are a number of existing templating, templated forms attempts in Django which are fine until they're big and then as soon as you get into big forms and nested forms it just performance plummets off a cliff. So, um, so whatever have, works. I'm not saying that you have a choice by the way. <laughs> <laughs> in your opinion. <laughs> it's very kind of you to consider it. Anyway. Depending on what version of Django you want to support, uh, you can provide one implementation that people provide their own into another engine. So <laughs> you have an easy bailout. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much, Armin.